My name is Ted Kaufman. I'm the executive director of Maine Audubon. And I'm happy to have you all here and squeezed in to hear Colin Woodard speak to us. We're very grateful to Maine Magazine for sponsoring tonight's talk. Uh, and we're very happy to have Colin Woodard, the award-winning journalist and author. Colin is currently the state and national affairs writer for the Portland Press Herald and Maine Sunday Telegram. I think you're all probably aware of that. And he's received the 2012 George Polk Award for his investigative reporting. He also writes for the Washington Monthly, the Christian Science Monitor, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and reviews books for the Washington Post. He's a native Mainer, and he has reported from more than 50 foreign countries and six continents, and lived for more than four years in Eastern Europe. He's the author of the New England bestseller, The Lobster Coast, which I'm working my way through right now, Rebels, Rusticators, and Struggle for a Forgotten Frontier, Ocean's End, Travels Through Endangered Seas, The Republic of Pirates, being the true and surprising story of the Caribbean pirates and the man who brought them down, on which a forthcoming NBC series, Crossbones, is based. And his fourth book, American Nations, a history of the 11 rival regional cultures of North America. I listened to National Public Radio um, a few months ago, probably six months ago. Uh, there was an interview with Colin about the American Nations book. And uh, the interview just captured my attention because um, I was struggling trying to understand my country. <laughs> you know that feeling too? You know, I, woke up, I woke up in another continent or something. Or wanted to. And wake up. <laughs> so these have been times of turmoil and, and I was really feeling quite troubled about it. And I'd lived long enough to see some turmoil. Um, but reading that book helped me get a better grip on what really makes up America. And uh, once you start to understand that, it's a little easier to deal with some of this. And I <coughs> sent copies of that book to family members who I talk about these very issues with and friends. Um, Colin's three-part series on the River Herring and the St. Croix, you may have read that, about the River Herring and the St. Croix, it was very, very valuable piece. It's the first of the three-part series that we've had this winter and spring. And as it turns out, uh, a whole set of organizations were working, and the tribes, working hard to open up the uh, fish passages on the St. Croix River to those alewives. And I thought it was very, very helpful to see that, that piece, um, educating the public, legislators, and others. Uh, and that fish passage is open now, and the alewives are returning to their native spawning area. And then he had a series on virtual schools, which was a crucial wake-up call for some of us, and as it turned out, I think, a showstopper. And his most recent reporting on the decision-making at the top of the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, I would call stirring. <laughs> so please give Tom a good Thank you very much. Can you all hear me in the back? Always the important first question. All good? Yes. Excellent. As you can hear, I'm the, um, I specialize in lengthy book subtitles. So, <laughs> uh, and thank you all for coming on this uh, warm Monday evening. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm here to talk to you about my most recent book, American Nations, which, as you probably gathered from the lengthy subhead, is a book about American regionalism and the importance of understanding it in order to understand our history our national identity, and indeed the current political cleavages, which are geographic even as they are ideological. Now, I don't think I'm you know, saying anything really novel to say that regionalism is important, right? Because we all know it's important, right? There was a civil war, and the South is supposedly still fighting it, right? And there are red states and blue states that never shall the twain meet. We know that presidential candidates are supposed to go before their respective party faithful in New Hampshire and say one set of things, and then two weeks later, to the same faithful of the same party in South Carolina, say a completely different set of things. <laughs> we know that even in this Tea Party era, that the people of Maine and Mississippi might as well be on different planets in terms of religious values, political priorities, 
ideas about what the proper role of government is, the separation between church and state, or even the meaning of such key words in the American lexicon as freedom or liberty. Or indeed, how we should define what is being an American, what are American values, and what is the American intent and identity. The argument that kind of filters through the book is that we're no more a united, single, unitary culture, a united nation, than the nation states of Europe are. Indeed, our component cultures are more diverse and share fewer values in common than any two European Union member states do to today. But we can't talk about these critical differences, which define the national and federal debate, in any kind of meaningful way, because we don't have the right map. Now, what do we mean about regions? People talk about regions all the time. We're pulling data by regions. We talk about regions, senators from regions, and congressmen from regions. But all of this is filtered through the idea that the regions are defined by the standard federal census domains. So we hear that there is a northeast, and a midwest, and a south, and a west. And uh, all of these borders follow state lines, which unfortunately for the national debate and understanding distorts and minimizes the true role of the regional cultures that are behind all of these divisions. That map misses the true cultural fissures, which are historically based and have been consistent throughout the centuries and rarely respect state or even international boundaries. Now again, what I'm saying, if you think about it, is nothing new. It makes perfect sense. We all know it in the periphery of our mind, right? Anybody here from Maryland? <laughs> you all know there are three Marylands, right? And you know exactly where the borders are between the three. Texans. Any Texans in the audience tonight? You all know that Austin is the state capital, but that San Antonio and Houston and Dallas are the hubs of three very different Texases. We know that coastal regions and the interiors of the West Coast states, right? That coastal fringe there of Oregon and Washington and California has virtually nothing in common with the interiors of those states or indeed the province of British Columbia's coastal zone. And yet the interiors of those states have a great deal in common with one another and the coastal regions do. Somehow the state boundaries aren't capturing something. There's like, how many of you um, remember that movie, Primary Colors? thinly veiled parable about Bill Clinton's first run for office. And there's a great scene in there where the, um, the, the James Cargill character is telling the political neophyte how statewide elections are won in Pennsylvania, where they are for an important primary. And he says this important piece of stage advice. Like, you got to understand that there's Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and Alabama in between. <laughs> And he was talking about the highlands of Alabama. He is on very sound ground. Think about the people of Missouri. On regional grounds, they can't even agree on the correct way to pronounce the state. <laughs> so we all know that the uh, state boundaries aren't capturing something important, right? But in times of uncertainty and discord, strangely enough, Americans seek, keep going back and trying to seek solace in the works of the founding fathers, hoping that if we could return to their ideals, if we understood and followed their original intent, we could regain our misplaced sense of common purpose, restore our civic strength, and indeed bring the union back to unity. But this effort is frustrated by the simple and incredibly obvious historical fact that the men who came together to confront a common enemy in 1775 and to convene in order to try to form some kind of lasting and more purposeful Union in 1787 to 1789 at the Constitutional Convention were not our country's founders, but rather the great grandchildren and great great grandchildren and great 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 grandchildren of the country's actual founders, who all came in the 17th and 18th centuries. Founders who shared very little in terms of purpose, purpose and intent and ideals. Now the fact is that our true regional cultures, and now we can cue the move forward one notch, have been with us since that time period. The original clusters of North American colonies, the Euro-American colonies, were settled by people from very distinct regions of the British Isles, and from France, and the Netherlands, and Spain. And each had their own religious, and political, and ethnographic characteristics. For generations, these distinct Euro-American Euro cultures developed in remarkable isolation from one another consolidating their own cherished principles and fundamental values, and expanding across the eastern half of the continent in nearly mutually exclusive settlement bands. 
The previous slide you saw the situation as they expanded from their original colonial parts up to 1776. That 1776 line is in dark. This is the expansion through about 1850 when the first real big waves of third party immigration started coming into the country. Those are the, broadly speaking, who settled um, which areas from where. Now some of these cultures champion individualism. Others, utopian social reform. Some believe themselves guided by divine purpose. Others champion freedom of conscience and inquiry. Some embraced a, a explicit Anglo-Protestant identity. Others, religious and ethnic and cultural pluralism. Some valued equality and democratic participation. Others, deference to a traditional aristocratic social order uh, modeled on the slave states of classical antiquity. Now, throughout the colonial period and the early republic, these regional cultures saw each other not as involved in some grand project that would eventually lead to some sort of unitary superpower, but rather as competitors for land, for settlers, for capital, and even as enemies. They took opposite sides in the English Civil War of the 1640s, in the American Revolution, in the War of 1812. Nearly all of these regional cultures that are on this map now would consider leaving the Union in the 80 years after Yorktown. And two of them, of course, went to war to do so in the 1860s. The point is, there's never been one America, but rather several Americas. It's a complex place. And there are 11 dominant cultures today. You can move forward and think map. County level resolution. Now, I'm going to briefly, very briefly, introduce these 11 nations to you of today. Um, now, the book goes into all the subtleties and such. And I'm, I'm, in the interest of time and speed and entertainment, I'm going to give you a cartoon-like <laughs> sketch of each one. So that this takes you know, 30 minutes rather than six hours. You all thank me for. <laughs> And we'll start, of course, because we're here to yanking them with yanking them up there at the top, which you can tell it does not just include New England, but extends on into parts of the uh, Atlantic Canada and on out into the upper Midwest zone. Now, this is a culture that was originally founded on the shores of Massachusetts Bay by radical Calvinists as a new Zion, right, right on the hill. Since the outset, it has put a great emphasis on perfecting earthly society through social engineering, individual self-denial for the common good. That's more Yankee than that, right? And the aggressive assimilation of outsiders, which some of you may have experienced here in Maine. <laughs> it is prized education, intellectual achievement, and community rather than individual empowerment. Very strange to the other American regional cultures, mind you. And is also prized broad citizen participation in politics and government. Witness the New England town meetings and the great skepticism that any power be devolved to the tyrannical power that might come forward if county government had any actual um, authority. <laughs> you know, every town must be a republic unto itself, or tyranny shall reign, right? All of this because it's seen as the public shield against the machinations of grasping aristocrats of the sort who were around during the Revolution in Britain and other would-be tyrants. Now, I'm, just for the, so you understand the map and its implications, so you had that original settlement, Massachusetts Bay and Yankee Dem, and the way all of this worked is during that period through the 1850s, when uh, upstate New York was settled, vast regions of upstate New York were settled by Massachusetts land companies. And the reason they were is the state of Massachusetts and the royal province of New York disagreed on who actually owned and claimed the lands up there in vast regions of New York. And so the compromise that was worked out ultimately was that New York would retain sovereignty, but Massachusetts would have land title. And so much of upstate New York was actually settled by Massachusetts-based land companies, with Massachusetts settlers often moving unmasked an entire you know, set of a village following their congregational Presbyterian uh, you know, uh, preacher right out there onto the frontier to carry on the, uh, the new Zion and the light on the hill. And not coincidentally, they, they ended up forming very New England-style towns and government functions out there. Ditto with that part of Ohio you see there. What is that? That's the Western Reserve of Ohio. 
i.e. the Western Reserve of Connecticut. Because Connecticut claimed that before the Ohio Territory was created. Same deal, Connecticut land companies had titled the land and settled it with people from Connecticut, which is why if you look around on your road atlas today at the Western Reserve of Ohio, you'll find all these towns named after towns in Connecticut, because that's where the people came from. And then you go forward one more generation when the Michigan Territory and, the, and what became Minnesota and Wisconsin um, uh, were settled, they were settled almost entirely. The initial settlement band, the territorial government, the initial governors and assemblymen and everyone were from either New England or the Western Reserve of Ohio or upstate New York and brought those institutions with them. So that's how the movement of these colonial uh, cultures worked. I can say the same about these other ones, and I won't, but that's how the pattern functions, just so you follow along with it. Moving on, south of us, once you leave Red Sox Nation, Fairfield, Connecticut, um, you hit New Netherland. Now, this wasn't established by the English at all. This is a region established by the Dutch at a time, in the mid-17th uh, century, when the Netherlands was the most sophisticated society in the Western world. And since then, the Big Apple Zone around New York City has displayed the salient characteristics of 17th century Amsterdam ever since. From the beginning onwards, both were global commercial trading cultures, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and materialistic, with a profound tolerance for diversity and an unflinching commitment to the freedom of inquiry and conscience. Now, like 17th century Amsterdam, upon which New York City was originally New Amsterdam, it was named after Amsterdam. When it was a town of 700, it had these characteristics. It emerged, and has emerged today, just as 17th century Amsterdam was in the Western world, as the global center of publishing, trade, finance, a magnet for immigrants, and a refuge for those persecuted by other regional cultures here, or other kingdoms in Europe at the time, from the Sephardim in the 17th century to gays, feminists, and Bohemians in the early 20th. So it's a very unusual place and completely and utterly different from the Yankeedom I just described in its fundamental values. Work your way down a little further, starting in the Midlands, which are starting in the Delaware Valley, right? This is America's great swing region, if you think about the election map today. And it was originally founded by English Quakers. This is William Penn's great utopian experiment, right? Now, the Quakers believed in humans' inherent goodness. And they welcomed people of many nations and creeds to these utopian colonies on the shores of Delaware Bay. And from the beginning, it was pluralistic and organized around the middle class. So the Midlands ended up spawning the culture of what we usually refer to as Middle America in the heartland, where ethnic and ideological purity have never been a priority, where government is seen as an unwelcome intrusion, which is very un-Yankee when you think about it, and political opinion has been moderate, even apathetic. It's been an ethnic mosaic from the start. It had a German rather than an English majority at the time of the revolution. It shares the Yankee belief that society should be organized to benefit ordinary people, but rejects top-down government intervention of the sort the Puritans would have embraced. As you can see, it also extends into Upper Canada for reasons I can describe later if anyone's interested. Working your way down a little further into the Chesapeake Zone and on into the low country of, the, uh, of eastern North Carolina, this is the Tidewater. Now, this is a region founded at the same time as the Puritans, right? And also founded from England. You'd think they'd be similar. So, couldn't be any more different than you could possibly imagine. It was, a, despite the Jamestown experiment, it was effectively settled in the aftermath of the English Civil War in the 1650s and 1660s by the younger sons of Southern English gentry. And it was meant from the beginning to reproduce the semi-feudal memorial system of the countryside they left behind, where economic and political and social affairs were run by and for landed aristocrats. Now, they had responsibilities back and forth, right? They, had, they, they were leading because they were the logical people to lead. They were aiming for sort of a 17th century version of Downton Abbey, <laughs> sort of the, 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 the idea. The problem with the Downton Abbey model in the context of the, uh, of the colonial American frontier was that they couldn't find anyone willing to step in and volunteer to play the role of the serfs, which <laughs> undermines the English manorial economic model. Um, so they turned first to indentured servants, and later, when even the indentured servants didn't want to show up, they slowly descended by the end of the 17th century into full-on chattel slavery. Didn't start that way, though, unlike other regional culture. 
Now, Tidewater has always been fundamentally conservative, as you might imagine from that description of its origins, with a high value placed on authority and tradition, and very little on equality or public participation in politics. It was the most powerful nation in the 18th century. But today, it's a nation in decline. Having been boxed out of westward expansion by its boisterous Appalachian neighbors, more on that later, uh, and more recently, eaten away from within by the expanding federal halos around the District of Columbia, seat of the federal government, and Norfolk, Virginia, and Hampton Roads, location of the world's largest naval base. In both cases, you have outlanders from the rest of the nations who are able to exist, having complete economic and social and cultural lives that have no reference to the tidewater at any time within those halos, just because of the sheer scale of the federal government, uh, at least since the 1940s. On to Greater Appalachia, which we spoke on. What you can see in white is much bigger than simply the Appalachian Mountains, extending onwards through the Ozarks and onto the hill country of Texas and much of Oklahoma. I've heard from Oklahomans about this. <laughs> founded in the early 18th century, somewhat later. It was founded by wave upon wave of settlers from the war-ravaged borderlands of Northern Ireland, Northern English, and England in the Scottish Lowlands. Now, Appalachia has been lampooned by generations of writers and screenwriters as the home of hillbillies and rednecks. But in reality, it's a transplanted culture formed in a state of near constant danger on these, on these British borderlands, uh, an upheaval, which is characterized by a warrior ethic and a deep commitment to personal sovereignty and individual liberty. This is a place where the police were not going to come to help you out. The police were out of the picture, and there was constant danger everywhere, and you watched out for your own kith and kin and your clan yourself. And that has a very different set of logic than, say, the Puritan, Puritan East Anglian settlers arriving as an entire village, giving out plots on the land and taxing themselves to build a school before they've even gotten off the boat. <laughs> different cultural context. And you can imagine the political ramifications that follow. Readers of the Lobster Coast will be well aware that one of the things when you descend down a level below this map into subcultures, of which there are many, and uh, that Maine has an important graft of Appalachian culture into the mid coast that's responsible for the insurrection against the great proprietors uh, in the uh, 1770s, 80s, and on through the 1820s. More on that some other time. Down further, you get to the deep south and dark there. This is a different place than the Tidewater. People talk about the South, no such thing. There are three Souths, when you really think about it. And the Deep South was established not by these younger sons of English gentry in the 1660s, but later on by the slave lords of English Barbados as a West Indies style slave plantation society. Hey, it was called in all the early maps, Carolina in the West Indies as if it were another Caribbean sugar colony stranded by accident in the subtropical lowlands of North America, which indeed it was. It was a, a, it's been ever since a bastion of oligarchic privilege and a version of classical republicanism that is modeled on the slave states of the ancient world, right? Ancient Greece and ancient Rome, where democracy was the privilege of a small and privileged caste and enslavement the natural lot of the many. Its slave and racial caste systems, of course, have since been uh, smashed by outside intervention, but its leaders do continue to fight for rollbacks against federal power, taxes targeting wealth, and robust environmental labor and consumer safety protections on the federal and state levels. Again, rather the opposite of the Yankee mindset, you can imagine how they might conflict if you put them all in the same federal system together. And on down to El Norte, uh, this is the, actually the oldest of the Euro-American nations, right? We're, we're used to talking about the settlement of the continent from east to west. No, the first Euro-American colonies came from the south up into the north, long before the Puritans or anyone else, or even the main settlers showed up. You could advance one more slide just to see what we're talking about. These are the far-flung borderlands of the, of, uh, of the Spanish-American empire, so far from the seats of power in Mexico City and certainly Madrid and Cadiz that they evolved their own characteristics. Now, just to remind you, we're used to the maps where, yeah, Spain used to own all western half of the country. Well, on paper they did. This, in dark, are the parts they actually settled prior to the US annexations. And you'll see that those actually match the uh, boundaries on the county map for today uh, as well. Now, this region also includes the northern provinces of Mexico. 
Now, most Americans are aware that this is a region apart on the US side of the border where Hispanic language and cultural and societal norms dominate. But few realize that among Mexicans, Norteños on either side of the border have a reputation for being more independent, self-sufficient, adaptable, and work-centered than their central and southern countrymen. Indeed, it's long been a hotbed of democratic reform and revolutionary settlement sentiment in the Mexican context. Various parts of the region have tried repeatedly before the US annexations to secede from Mexico and to form independent buffer states between the two federations, the Republic of the Rio Grande, the Republic of Texas. You know, when Texas seceded and briefly became its own independent state, it wasn't just Austin and the Anglo settlers. They were completely backed by the entire Spanish-speaking elite of the province of Texas. Why? Because they wanted to form a third state away from the alien culture of Mexico City and the emerging United States. It didn't work out that way, though. Today, it's a culture that stretches for about 100 miles on either side of the current border and resembles in many ways Germany during the Cold War. Two peoples with a common culture separated from one another by a very large wall. Now you could go backwards one, back to the county map. All right, these two nations I'm about to talk to now are the two second generation nations. We're talking much, much younger places in some ways still being settled. These are places settled in the 19th century. Timelines are much shorter, population densities are shorter, and they were not settled, like these other places, by Euro-American settler groups coming from the other continent and colonizing, but rather occurred at a time when people from these regional cultures were coming and colonizing the West. So they're, they're second generation in their settlement patterns. Um, the first of these two that were settled was the left coast, that Chile-like fringe that I talked about uh, before, pressed between the mountains and the ocean. Um, it was originally founded essentially by two groups, merchants, missionaries, and woodsmen from New England who arrived by sea, by ship around the Cape and all the way back up, and tended to dominate the towns. And by the way, they were trying, they were led by missionaries who were explicitly trying to uh, uh, build a new New England on the Pacific. Built congregational um, universities to be centers of cultural production and to save the Pacific from all of those scary Catholic people and Asians and from anyone else who might show up. Um, but they also faced a second group, farmers, prospectors, and fur traders from the Appalachian parts of the Midwest, who generally arrived by wagon overland over the horrific empty of Euro European settlers far west, which was such a difficult place that nobody was trying to settle there until they absolutely had to. And they were crossing over there, and they dominated the countryside and the mines. Now, the Yankee missionaries spent considerable effort trying to build this you know, New England on the Pacific, but they were only partially successful because they were competing with the other group, and they ended up with this hybrid culture that is the left coast today. It combines Yankee utopianism with an Appalachian emphasis on individual self-expression and actualization and exploration. And it's been a rather fecund combination. If you think about it, think about every single high-tech company that dominates the planet today are all there. Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Twitter, <laughs> anybody you can possibly think of in Silicon Valley or around Redmond, Washington. It's a very interesting place. And it remains, and has remained since its foundation, a staunch ally, despite being on the other end of the map, of Yankeedom in virtually every single aspect, and clashes on virtually every issue of the day with the people of the far western sections of its own provinces and territories. And on to the far west, which they are competing with. This is the other second generation nation. It's the last place that was settled, and the one place where I will admit that environmental factors really did trump any ethnographic ones. It was in the 19th, late 19th century, when it was effectively settled, it was high and dry and remote, so much so that it stopped the cultural practices and economic practices and agriculture of folkways of these Eastern nations right in their tracks. And with only minor exceptions, it could only be colonized through the deployment of vast industrial scale resources, railroads, heavy mining equipment, ore smelters, dams, irrigation systems that could transfer water from one watershed to another, staggering, staggering undertakings. And as a result of this, settlement was largely directed 
and controlled by large corporations headquartered in distant New York and Chicago and San Francisco and Boston or by the federal government itself which held control of much of the land. And the effect was that the whole time was settled and ever since it's been exploited as an internal resource colony by the rest of us. And the far west people are well aware of it and resent it to this day and have oscillated in this resentment of their dependent status between focusing their anger on the federal government, as is currently the case, or during the populist era of the 1940s against the Anaconda Coppers and Union Pacific Railways and Hearst Corporations of their day. And again, it's a pendulum that can swing back and forth depending on the political winds and the uh, political ideologies that try to approach um, their sentiments. Now, there are two other nations on the map. Both of them only have small enclaves within what's the United, United States but a uh, very uh, large uh, influence upon Canada. Um, one of them is New France, um, which obviously is French speaking and founded uh, under Champlain's experiment originally. It blends the folkways of Ancien Regime Northern French peasantry with the traditions and values of the Aboriginal people they encountered in the St. Lawrence Valley in Northwestern North America. It's down to earth, egalitarian and consensus driven. Now remember, this was founded during, during Louis XIV, the Sun King, the guy who built Versailles' tenure. And that's what this was supposed to be. New France was supposed to be another extension of that grand, you know, uh, you know autocratic, uh, centralized uh, European royalty uh, system, and a big rural agricultural place with lords and peasants upon the land. It didn't work out that way. They assigned lords with their you know, feudal estates, and they sent peasants over. And the peasants got off the boat and with their hose and stuff and started work and quickly ran into the Indians. And the Indians were like, hey, come, come snowshoeing with us. You know? <laughs> Let's have a good time. And they were like, that sounds a lot like what we do in northern France. We're with you. And they just abandoned the land for the most part. They hung out, intermarried, Matisse families formed. They ended up hanging out and having a lot more in common with the, uh, with the Indians they encountered in the area than they did with their aristocratic masters. And it seemed a much better deal. So the whole system fell apart. And very quickly, you had all these lords writing back you know, to the colonial office, all these records of, you know, Lord so-and-so is starving because all the peasants left and he does not know how to hoe the field. <laughs> Total failure. And led to a culture completely different than France at the time and indeed a unique place today. Many of the characteristics actually can be seen despite the incredible environmental differences in the Cajun, Acadian uh, exodus um, results in the southern parts of New France. Let the good times roll in both places indeed. <laughs> After a long period of imperial oppression, uh, the new French people, who uh, internally pollsters are found to be the most liberal people in the continent, if you want to speak English in Montreal, well, that's another matter, but internally. <laughs> but after a long period of imperial oppression, they've imparted many of their attitudes about consensus-driven negotiation upon the Canadian Federation writ large, where multiculturalism and negotiated consensus are treasured. Negotiations write that in the Wabanaki and the, uh, the uh, St. Lawrence Indian and Montague tradition are um, negotiations which continue without end because the whole point is that the negotiation shall continue. <laughs> Very Canadian. <laughs> and finally, First Nation, which if you could see would extend on over the entire Canadian shield, large parts of Alaska, extend over Greenland, much of Labrador, Nunavut, Northwest Territories, and so forth. This is the newest or the oldest of the nations, depending on how you want to look at it. It was populated by Native American groups and tribes, many Inu and Inuit speaking, that generally never gave up their land by treaty or paper or any other reason, or never fooled and tricked it to anybody. Because they were so remote, nobody bothered with them. And because of that, they largely retained the cultural practices and knowledge that allowed them to survive for centuries and millennium in one of the most hostile regions on the planet on their own terms. And now, they're reclaiming their sovereignty, having won considerable autonomy in Alaska and in Nunavut, and self-governing nation-state status in Greenland, uh, which is on the standing on the threshold of full independence. Now, the, the realization in the Canadian context that they had never given up their land, the, the Indians of many of these places actually brought this forward to the Canadian uh, equivalent of our Supreme Court, and they, they agreed, well, it's true. I guess you never gave up the land, it's still yours. So suddenly, all of these tribes in the far north have 
control and a seat at the table and decisions of what happens in the greatest reserve on the continent of oil and water and energy and trees and anything else you can imagine that a hungry planet wants. And are having their own attorneys trained and hired and are actually uh, deciding things based on their own interests and mores. It's fascinating, and they're quite different mores. Because if you ever wondered, as I did going through you know, school and history, you know, gosh, you know, if the Indians hadn't been wiped out, what would they teach us today? What would they bring to us as lessons in humanity in a, in a densely populated planet about how to live with 21st century challenges? Gosh, I wish I knew. Well, you don't have to wish to know. Go look to Greenland. They're still there. And they're about to have their own independent state. And it's a completely <coughs> different way of looking at things than the West does. Because Greenland, despite being part of the Kingdom of Denmark, one of the most wealthy states in the, uh, in the, uh, in the world, um, Everybody, there's no private land owned by anybody. Everybody's house is owned on communally owned leased land held by the people because in their culture, the idea that you can own land is as crazy as the idea that I can own air molecules. At least for now, so the US Patent Office says coming up, but that is the arrangement. And um, for instance, you go to a, a Inuit village in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the winter, you go out and you, you go through the trouble of uh, hunting seal or, or any traditional animals out there, polar bear, you bring it back and you put it in the communal freezer. And anybody in the community can walk in and take any of it anytime they want. And there's no accounting because it belongs to everybody. And finally, you know, I was up in Greenland reporting a few years ago and I noticed that women were running almost everything. They were running the government and the, bishop, the Lutheran bishop of uh, Greenland was a woman and the foreign minister and all the mayors. I started to ask the foreign minister, what's going on with that? She said, well, We've never in our culture, it's not that we're um, matriarchal, we've just, women have never had secondary status. It never occurred to us. She said, you know, when the, when the Danes came in the uh, 1700s to colonize us, and they came and they said, we have a god, and he looks like us, and we want you to worship him. We all looked at each other, we said, he? <laughs> so as you can see, it's a very different take on 21st century life. <laughs> So these are the regional cultures, the real map, and as I've mentioned before, their effect on history has been profound. You'll see this map echoed in the battle line of the English Civil War and the American Revolution, in the debates in the First Continental Congress by congressional district or represent, a representative, in the debates leading up to the U.S. Civil War and the key votes, in the culture wars and the civil rights struggles in the 1960s, and in the presidential maps of almost any hotly contested election in our history. If you roll forward one, and I'll give a few examples, actually two, go past El Norte again, and one more. Yeah, there you go. You've seen that map a million times, right? There's a blue state, red state map. Actually, I haven't reversed the colors. The red it really is the Republican areas. But this isn't the 2008 and the you know, recent presidential election. This is Woodrow Wilson versus Charles Hughes in 1916. <laughs> you can see it all. You can see the left coast. You can see Yankee and so on and so forth. Because the Republican Party, for the first century of its history, was founded in Yankee and was explicitly the party of the Yankees. Absolutely and totally. Now, of course, the parties have inverted. The parties are fleeting. It's the regional cultures that stay and show you things. You can f move forward uh, to one more notch. Ta da! Barack Obama versus John McCain. You see, the map is extremely similar besides the inversion of the parties. Hey, check out the Western Reserve of Ohio. Hop into here on the left coast. Check out almost all of El Norte. Hey, where was El Norte before? And look, Strange, there's a bunch of blue dots where it used to be a one solid monochrome uh, deep south. Why is that? Well, Hispanic people and black people can now vote in what were caste dominated systems in 1960. So you'll see some variation there. Um, move forward one more slide. This is one of my favorite slides. By the way, all this data comes after the book was published. I'm just showing how the paradigm carries out beyond the knowledge I could have had when writing the book. So you know, that made the paradigm fit the data as opposed to the other way around. Um, this is a map. Um, between the 2004 uh, George W. Bush versus John Kerry election and the Barack Obama versus John McCain election, the, the map is asking, in each county, um, did the county vote more Democratic or more Republican between 2004 and 2008? Meaning, like, did more people decide, hey, I'm going to vote for, you know, switch their votes to the Democrats or to the Republicans? As you can see, the answer was almost everyone went more for the Democrats and Obama in that landslide election. With one very obvious exception, notice the area almost identical to Greater Appalachia in solid red. Barack Obama has a profound Greater Appalachia problem. He had it in that election. He had it in subsequent elections. You know, yet the um, 
the uh, recent primaries in the new election cycle of 2012, the Democratic primaries for the presidency with a sitting president, right? Barack Obama, he's an outlander in the American nation's terms in that he grew up in Hawaii and then came as a young man to the University of Chicago, Yankee institution, the age of Yankeedom, and has spent his entire political and professional career in Yankee. He was basically a Yankee politician. Um, however, that doesn't go over very well in greater Appalachia. And you could see it in the Democratic primaries in this election cycle. Um, in West Virginia, in this most recent election, 41% of Democratic voters cast ballots for a Texas prison inmate instead of the sitting president of their own party. In Kentucky, 42% of Democratic voters in the primary preferred uncommitted to the sitting president of their party. In Arkansas, Obama only won the Democratic primary 58 to 41 over an attorney from Tennessee. <laughs> but lost every one of Arkansas's Appalachian counties by 30 to 50 percentage points in his own party's primary. Now, you would think that would have had a devastating effect in the hotly contested election we just had between him and Mitt Romney. Except there's a catch. Mitt Romney also had a greater Appalachian problem. <laughs> Yankee-born son of a Yankee governor from the most Yankee of states, right? And with essentially a Yankee Republican platform and so suddenly he inverted all of his values in the last couple months of the election, which I don't think helped him in the end, but nobody trusted him, right? Because he's really a closet Yankee. He did terribly in these same places. And to show you what I mean, let's, uh, let's move forward. I mean, one, you know, Romney won almost every, um, uh, in, in the Republican primaries, he won almost every Yankee, he swept Yankeedom, he won all the left coast, he won every single county in the Republican primaries in Massachusetts and Vermont, comfortable majorities almost everywhere else, in the Western Reserve. Here is the Republican primary vote by county in the last election. The green are the Romney counties. The browns are Rick Santorum, because this is a wonderful, the, the, the primary, the, the general election wasn't so good for American nation terms, because you had two Yankees with the same regional strengths and weaknesses. The primaries for the Republican Party, though, you had Mitt Romney, the Yankee, you had Rick Santorum, the Appalachian guy who managed to win some Midland counties, and you had uh, Newt Gingrich, who was a creature of the Deep South and spent his entire political career there. Of course, not everybody has regional characteristics. Ron Paul, in many ways, an anachronism, including regionally. But the three leading candidates all had strong regional platforms and regional success. And you can see that where Rick Santorum just dominated um, much of the Appalachian regions of Ohio and Mitt Romney owes all of his uh, victory in the Ohio primary to uh, the Western Reserve and the Yankee settled regions. If you move forward one, you'll see almost the same thing coming up here again. Illinois, again, the Yankee parts went for Romney, everywhere else went much to Santorum. And one more further. Yeah, these are real interesting ones. Alabama, Mississippi. You remember back then, everyone was saying, well, Newt Gingrich's one chance is in Alabama, Mississippi's primaries the same day. That's where he's going to regain his strength, right? And polls are too close to call in the Republican primary. My gosh. Total nonsense. He got completely routed in both places. And the reason he got routed is the pollsters didn't read my book. <laughs> so, they weighted their polls based on income, race, and class and gender, not on regional cultural location. And guess what? Alabama has a huge Appalachian section, which you will see in dark brown, that went for Santorum by 20 and 30 points in every county, while indeed, in the deep southern regions, the blue, which is uh, New Gingrich, and Santorum fought a deadlock there, but he couldn't make up the Appalachian loss, and Mitt Romney won in the Republican primaries in some of the uh, most affluent parts of the state. Um, in the sort of country club Republican crowd who, uh, who backed him in the South. And the same thing for Mississippi. The, uh, it's a little bit closer. If you move forward one more. Only because the Appalachian region of Mississippi is much smaller as a portion of the population, but still gave him the edge. So it affects uh, political calculations a great deal. And uh, if you move forward one more. Just so you know, there's the most recent election. You can see the same trends laid out. And one more. It's not just you know political party elections. This is a map of California's famous Proposition 8, gay marriage or no gay marriage, right? Those supporting gay marriage and Prop 8 is the left coast. And those, um, those uh, opposing gay marriage is the entire of El Norte and the interior, almost to a T. One or two exceptions in the entire map. 
and move forward one more, please. And I'll leave you with this, because one question here in the Q&A you ought to be asking is, well, come now, how do all these regional cultures that were founded back by you know, a bunch of white Europeans <coughs> in the you know, 1600s and 1700s, how could they possibly still exist and have an echo given all the people who've come since and overwhelmed that population base from all the rest of the cultures and uh, parts of the world, right? Well, part of the answer I will give you is encoded in this map. Because this is the US census returns marked by county for the 1900 census, right after the great waves of 19th century uh, immigration. And the question asked of respondents throughout the country was, were you born in the United States or in a foreign country? So this is a poll showing you the percentage of immigrants. The darker the color, the more people not born within the United States in 1900. Notice the giant white area of no people from outside the country have moved in. <laughs> Regional cultural characteristics affected and dictated where immigrants decided to move. They made positive choices. If you were fleeing Europe and its feudal societies and deep despotisms and lack of democracy, you were not going to go to an oligarchic system run by slave planters. There was no land for you. There were no opportunities for you. They stayed out of greater Appalachia and the Tidewater and the Deep South, reinforcing the differences. The concentrations. We're in New Netherlands, grabbed a vast majority of immigrants. And in the Midlands, both New Netherlands and the Midlands embraced pluralism and a multi-ethnic ethos. And that word got around very quickly. And also in Yankeedom, which did not embrace multi-ethnic, uh, but, but rather that people were supposed to, um, regardless of your original origins, take on and assimilate to the Anglo-Protestant uh, cultural norms and the Protestant work ethic of John Calvin. But there were jobs there and lots of industrial jobs. But the difference was, you know, think about it. This is the American genius and identity that we are um, uh, a mosaic of peoples from all over the world carrying on our different languages and cultural practices side by side. Yes, in the Midlands and New Netherlands. What's the dominant culture of New York City? Who knows? <laughs> the whole point is there isn't one, right? It's this great hodgepodge, right? But that's completely alien to the other regional cultures. Some have said that, but I don't know that that's entirely true. That's a big competition. But the, um, the, the Yankeedom zone was not that. It was the melting pot concept. Now, what does melting pot concept mean? It means you're going to assimilate. You're going to be melted down and join the rest of us, right? And that was the melting pot partly comes from Henry Ford's factories in Yankeedom in Michigan, where he, had, he was attracting. He wanted all sorts of immigrants to work there. But he, in Yankee fashion, he would benignly assist these immigrants in becoming real Americans. And that consisted, he had schools to teach them English and cultural practices and how to keep yourself clean, how to conduct yourself, and how to dress. And at the end of this cultural assimilation program that his companies provided, they held this graduation ceremony. On the big stage, you would get to invite your entire family to come. And all of the immigrant workers would come who were graduating, all wearing their traditional attire that they supposedly came off the boat from. And they come to the stage, and there's this gigantic paper mache, two-story tall um, cauldron or melting pot. And on the, the scaffolding up high were their teachers. And they'd walk into the melting pot, and the teachers had these big spoons that they were stirring. <laughs> And then the, the, the workers were changing. They came out the other side and parading along in identical American suits. They've been transformed into American. <laughs> totally different concept and contradictory. So I'll just leave you with that. And I thank you all very much.